Today we're going to be in 1 Samuel 23, uh, 1 Samuel 23, as we are continuing this series on the life of David. Um, David is described two times in Scripture as a man after God's own heart. Um, it's described of him in uh, the Old Testament. It's also described of him in the New Testament. And so um, what we're kind of doing on this five-week journey together is kind of uncovering what does it really mean to be after the heart of God. I mean, I think we all would love to be described that way, right? Um, if you were having your, your funeral tomorrow, I mean, what, what better words to be said of you um, that you were a person who pursued the very heart of God. Now, um, we're going to learn that uh, pursuing the heart of God does not mean perfection. Uh, David even had a moment of his life where, um, where he was broken, okay, where he kind of uh, messed up in, in a big way times two. And so pursuing the heart of God doesn't mean that you're perfect, um, but it does mean some things. And last week, um, as David is fighting Goliath, we learned that pursuing the heart of God means that you trust God. When everyone else looked at Goliath, they, they saw a giant. Um, but when David looked at Goliath, he, he saw that God was the giant in the story. And so he trusted God, all right? So today we're going to kind of take that um, a little step further of what it means to pursue the heart of God. But first... Um, all of us have different hats that we wear, right? We all have different hats that we wear. I'm not talking about uh, baseball hats or, or cowboy hats, but uh, when someone says that, man, I'm wearing a lot of different hats, what do they mean? They mean I, I, I have a lot of different roles. There's a lot of different roles that I play in, in life. Now, uh, maybe one role that you play, one hat that you wear might be the hat of a parent. You're you're a mom, you're a dad. Maybe you play the, the role of a, a spouse, right? You're a, a husband, you are a wife. Maybe you play the role of a friend or a confidant or a competitor. Maybe you play the role of, um, of, of an employee or an employer. So you can kind of see that there's a lot of different hats that we, that we wear in life, hats that we put on, hats that we take off, and, and things like that. Um, it's wise to know what hat you're wearing at the right time, right? Because you wouldn't want to talk to your kids like you would talk to a coworker, and you probably wouldn't want to talk to a coworker or a boss like you would your kids. So it's very wise to know kind of what hat you're wearing um, at that particular time. Now, there's some hats that we wear that we don't get to take off. Some hats that we wear, there's some roles that we play in life that we don't get to kind of set that off to the side and say, well, I, I choose not to, to be that role today. I choose not to wear that hat. Look, um, uh, if you're an American citizen, okay, that is a hat that you wear no matter what, right? Um, if you're a Christian, if you're here today and you say, I, I would identify myself as a Christian, as a believer in Jesus Christ who, who died in, in my place so that I can have eternal life, that is not a hat that we get to take off. It's not something that we put on Sunday to come to a Christian church and, and worship Christ, but then when we leave and we go to work on Monday, we get to set that hat aside. So um, there are some hats that we should wear all the time. If you're with me, say, I am. All right, so there is a hat that David wears all the time. In other words, there is a role that David plays specifically that we kind of see as a thread that is woven all throughout his life. It's, it's something we see at the very uh, beginning um, as he's a shepherd. It's something we see as he defeats Goliath. It's something we see in the story of the day. And it's something we see that he wears even to the end of his life. Now, he wore the hat of shepherd. We talked about that last week. Next week, we're going to talk about how he puts on the hat of, of king and he starts to play that role. But the role we're going to talk about today, the hat that David wears that he doesn't take off for his entire life, is the role that he plays of a warrior. David, I don't know what you kind of think of when you think of David, but if you can kind of summarize his life, I think it would be this. Uh, David was a warrior. He was a warrior. And I believe that God wants us to be warriors, and I believe I would even kind of take it a step further to say that if you're going to make the decision to be a person that pursues after the heart of God, that we have to decide on a daily and a regular basis to be a warrior for his kingdom. Now, when I say the word warrior, what comes to mind? Think of a, a mental image right now, all right? Here's warrior. Close your eyes. Kind of think about it. All right, raise your hand if your warrior has a sword, 
in his hand, all right? Raise your hand if he's wearing a helmet. Raise your hand um, if the person in your head, you know, has a gun and is off at war and there's clouds and there's smoke, all right, a, a few of you, right? These are kind of the, the images that we think of as warriors. So um, before we kind of jump into 1 Samuel 23, let's start off by defining what a warrior is. What, is. what do I mean when I say a warrior? Now, there's three parts to this definition, and here's what it is. A warrior, number one, is someone who courageously decides. Someone who courageously decides. Turn your neighbor and say, courageously decides. Okay, someone who courageously decides. In other words, if you're forced to go into battle, you're not a warrior, you're a slave. Okay, so a warrior is somebody who makes the decision that they're going to go to battle. Their arm's not being twisted. They're not being drugged into battle. They're the one that courageously decides. They raise their hand. They volunteer. They say, I'll go to battle. All right? Now, here's the thing. It's not just someone who decides. It's someone who what? courageously decides. Listen, millennials, and I can say this because I'm on the front end of millennials, all right? You're not a warrior because you decided to make your bed today, okay? That doesn't make you a warrior. Guys, men, husbands, you're not a warrior because you decided to do the dishes, all right? That's not a, these aren't the kind of decisions that, that, that we're talking about. These just kind of everyday mundane decisions. We're talking about courageously deciding to do what? Here's the second part of our definition. Someone who courageously decides to boldly act. That's a warrior. Someone who courageously decides to boldly act. In other words, they don't just sit on the sideline, but they courageously decide that, look, I will do something about the situation. Non-warriors say things like, that's not my job. Non-warriors say things like, I really can't make a difference. Non-warriors say things like, I don't really have any sort of skills or anything that I have to offer. Non-warriors say things like, someone else will step up and fight that battle. But a true warrior is someone who courageously decides to boldly act, and we can't end our definition here, there's a third part to our definition, for a worthy cause. All right, someone who courageously decides to boldly act, not for an unworthy cause, and not for no reason, but for a worthy cause. Listen, if you act for no reason, if you act boldly for no reason, you're not a warrior, you're a bully. Okay, a bully is someone who pushes people over, just kind of get out of my way. They, they, they do bold things, but for really no reason at all. Maybe there's kind of some selfish reasons wrapped, wrapped up in there, but that's a bully. Uh, someone who does not act is called a wimp. Okay, so we kind of have two ends of the spectrum, and we're, all, we're kind of defining what a warrior is, right? So on this end of the, of the spectrum, you have bullies. Uh, on this end of the, of the spectrum, you have wimps. But I believe what God is calling us to do, and what we see in the life of David, is he is calling us to be warriors. He's calling us to courageously make the decision that we will boldly act for a worthy cause. Now, we can jump into 1 Samuel uh, chapter 23, um, just to kind of catch you up, if you were here last week or if you weren't, we were in 1 Samuel 17. That's the story where David uh, defeats Goliath. Again, we can look at that story and say, hey, David was a warrior. Um, we can look at when David was a shepherd and he was fighting um, lions and bears and protecting sheep. We could say that David was a warrior. We could look at when David, when he was a king, and we could see that, that even in the king and the wise decisions that he was making, that David was a warrior. So this is not a hat that David sets off to the side. So last week, uh, 1 Samuel 17, he defeats Goliath. Um, this, the king named Saul, King Saul, starts to get jealous of David. And part of that is because all the people start singing um, that David has, or Saul has slain his thousands, but David his ten thousands. If you're the king, you, he didn't like that whatsoever. So he wants to try to kill uh, David. And so David leaves. He's on the run from King Saul. He's living in hiding. He's rallied some men together that he can kind of do life with and, and war on, on things together with. And so in 1 Samuel 23, here's what it says. Then they told David, saying, Behold, um, I like that word, behold. 
behold. It's kind of like draw your attention to it. Here's your dare for the day. I want to um, dare you to try to use the word behold in a sentence today. Okay, I dare you to do that. Behold, the Philistines are fighting against Keilah and are plundering the threshing floors. So David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go and attack these Philistines? And the Lord said to David, Go and attack the Philistines and deliver Keilah. But David's men said to him, Behold, we are afraid here in Judah. How much more then if we go to Keilah against the ranks of the Philistines? Then David inquired of the Lord once more, and the Lord answered him and said, Arise, go down to Keilah, and I will give the Philistines into your hands. So David and his men went to Keilah and fought with the Philistines, and he led away their livestock and struck them with a great slaughter. Thus David delivered the inhabitants of Keilah. So, is David a warrior? Let's kind of go back and look at our definition of warrior. What's a warrior? Someone who courageously decides to boldly act for a worthy cause. Did David courageously decide? Did he make a decision? Yes. Part of his decision was consulting the Lord and asking, Lord, what would you have me to do? Did he boldly act? Yes. He doesn't sit back and say that's somebody else's problem. He boldly acts and he moves his men towards Keilah and he actually goes to battle. Is he fighting for a worthy cause or a selfish cause? He's battling for a worthy cause, isn't he? He's protecting a defenseless people. So David, by our definition today, and this definition actually comes from what David is doing, um, by our definition is living life as a warrior. Now, some of you, you, you might be thinking this. If you're not thinking it, maybe it's the person next to you. You're thinking this. Wasn't that David's job? I mean, wasn't that what he was called to do? He, he was a warrior. He was an army guy. In fact, he was a kind of a commander in chief at this point um, in his life. Wasn't that his job to go into battle? Can I tell you something? This was not his job. This was not David's battle to fight. You know whose battle it was? It was King Saul's battle. King, it was King Saul's responsibility. It was kind of in the rules of engagement for being a king. Part of what you were supposed to do is protect your people. You're supposed to protect the land. You're supposed to protect the cities. And so here, one of the, the cities in Israel, Keilah, is being attacked by outsiders, being attacked by the Philistines. It was King Saul's responsibility to go to war. It was King Saul's responsibility to fight for these people. It was King Saul's responsibility to protect. But King Saul was shirking that responsibility. King Saul was dropping the ball. Why? He had some personal selfish matters at hand. He was seeking after the life of David. He was distracted by the calling that God had placed him in by being the king of Israel. Listen, it was King Saul's responsibility. And so when David heard about Keilah, he could have very easily said, not my problem. Go ask King Saul and his men. That that would actually be more beneficial, right? Because they're pursuing him. Let let King Saul go and fight Keilah. That way he's not pursuing me. King David could have said, or uh, young David before he's king, could have said, you know what? That's not my problem. It's not my fight. I have enough on my plate right now. But that's not what a warrior does. What does a warrior do? Courageously decides to boldly act for a worthy cause. I want you to think as we kind of move forward through this message, I want you to think about the worthy cause that God is placing on your heart today. I want you to think about that. That being a a warrior for the Lord doesn't mean that that we have to grab our swords or grab our guns and grab our shields and just go off and, and just start attacking everyone that stands in our way. Let me tell you something. Maybe, maybe your marriage is on the rocks. You know that's a worthy cause. Maybe today God's placing that on, on your heart to start fighting, to courageously decide, to boldly act for a worthy cause. Maybe you're a parent today. Listen, raising your kids, that's a, what a worthy cause, right? And maybe you're kind of, you're in the battle, you're in the fight, and, and you've got little kids, and some days you just want to pull your hair out. Anyone say amen to that? Maybe you have teenagers, and there's some days that you just want to pull your hair out. 
Maybe you have grown kids, and there are some days that you just want to pull your hair out, and you're just wondering, man, is it really worth it? Should I even do Should I even do this? Is it making a difference? Listen, courageously decide to boldly act for a worthy cause. Maybe God's placing a people group on your heart. Today, um, at the, in, the, in the back, you'll see a, a table. Um, some young ladies in our church are going to be going to Peru next, next summer. Um, God has placed this uh, on their heart, and um, they've signed up to go this past summer um, at, a, at a student conference, and so they've got some little baked goods and things that they've, that they've provided. Man, they're going there for a worthy cause. They've, they're courageously deciding to boldly act for a worthy cause. Maybe it's single moms. Maybe it's kids that have been uh, misplaced out of their, their homes and placed into to foster care. Maybe it's a special needs community. Maybe it's, it, maybe it's the elderly. Maybe it's kids right here at Carver who are entering the third grade and they still can't read. Listen, God is calling us as his followers, not just to, not just to sit and, and soak and, and kind of live in a, in a safe environment. He's calling us to be his warriors. He's calling us to courageously decide to boldly act for a worthy cause so the world can see that we're not just fighting you know, um, against the world, but we're fighting for truth. We're fighting for his word. We're fighting for what God is calling us to do. So um, I wanna kind of wrap up by, by telling you three things that we can kind of learn from David about being a, a warrior. If you're like, yes, God's calling me to, to be a warrior for a specific um, area in your life, I want to point out kind of three things real, real quickly. Here's what a warrior does. Number one, um, a warrior prays for wisdom. A warrior prays for wisdom. This is kind of where it starts. What, is, um, what does David do when he hears about the Philistines attacking Keilah? Verse 2, it says, So David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go and attack these Philistines? Sometimes when we, when we hear of a need, we, we want to rush in and save the day. Right? We, we act more like a superhero than we do a warrior. Listen, you're not a superhero. God doesn't call us to be superheroes. But he does call us to be warriors for his kingdom. And part of being a warrior is engaging the spiritual battle through prayer. And so what does David pray? He prays and he asks, Lord, um, shall I go and attack these Philistines? Basically what he's praying is, God, um, what would you have me do? I've heard about the situation, but before I just kind of go in and think that I'm, I'm the superhero and, and if I'm there, I'll solve all the problems. Before I just act, God, I don't want to be ahead of you and I don't want to be behind you. Lord, I want to be in step with what, what your plan is. And so, Lord, what would you have me do? I wonder how our lives would change and how our lives would be different if instead of just doing stuff, if we would pause and we would pray and we would ask God, God, what would you have me do? And then we sit and we listen and we wait for God to answer and move. That's what David does. He's, he's praying. I believe that David knew that the battle would be won, not on the battlefield in hand-to-hand -hand combat with the Philistines, but the battle would be won in prayer. And getting on his knees and seeking God's will and his direction in this circumstance. Did you know that, that we're living in enemy territory? Did you know that? Um, not, not because I said it, um, the scripture says it in 1 John um, chapter one, uh, sorry, chapter five, verse 19. Um, here's what John writes. He, there's two things that we know. John says, we know that we are of God. Because we've been saved by grace through our faith, because we've been, our sins have been covered by the blood of Jesus Christ, here's what we know. There's no question. He has confidence. We know that we are of God. There's a second thing that he knows. He says, and that the whole world lies in the what? What's the word? In the power. The whole world lies in the power of the evil one. The whole world lies in the dominion and the authority of the evil one. Did you know? that we are living in enemy territory. As a warrior for Christ, okay, as a warrior for Jesus, for his kingdom, right now, because you're in the world, even though you're of God, all right, we know that, you're behind enemy lines. Now, don't let that scare you. Um, that's, a, that's where God has us, 
all right? We are behind enemy lines. That means we're in, we're in hand-to-hand combat. But listen, we don't need to fight against the enemy using his tactics and his, wow, because he has power here, right? He, he has home field advantage, doesn't he? He has home field advantage. So what do we do? When we pray, what we're doing is we're moving the battlefield where Satan has the advantage and we're moving it into God's territory. <laughs> we're taking home field advantage when we start praying and we start seeking God, asking him to intervene and praying, Lord, what would you have me do? So I want to start here because I don't want you to get the idea that warriors just mean you just take off and you just fight and you just take on everything. No, a warrior is someone who first and foremost pauses and prays. They, they, someone who prays for wisdom. There's a second thing um, about being a warrior, and it's this. A warrior is someone who perseveres in opposition. He prays for wisdom. A warrior also perseveres in opposition. When the Lord says, yes, go down and attack the Philistines and deliver, K.E. Law, verse 3, but David's men said to him, behold, we are afraid here in Judah. How much more if we go to K.E. Law against the ranks of the Philistines. Here's what they're saying. Hey, David, are you sure about this? Because from where we stand, we're already scared. We already have enough on our plate. We already have enough to be afraid of. Did you forget that King Saul is on our tail and we're living in hiding? We're living a life on the run and you want us to go to Keilah and pick a fight with the Philistines? We have an army behind us. The last thing we need is an army in front of us. So David, we don't think this is a good idea. David, we don't think the timing is right. David, we don't think we have enough energy to engage in this battle. Listen, when you make the decision to live as a warrior, can I tell you something? There will be opposition. Because without opposition, listen, there's no courageous decision to boldly act for a worthy cause. But when you make a courageous decision, you with me? (laughs) To boldly act for a worthy cause, guess what? There's gonna be some opposition. Sometimes that opposition comes from the outside. It comes from the haters. It comes from the people that don't understand and they're thinking, "Why, why would you do that? Why would you sell your home and pick up and move um, across the world? Why would you start this nonprofit ministry for, for this people group? Why in the world would you do that? The opposition starts to come. And you know what? Sometimes that opposition doesn't come from the outside. That opposition comes from the inside. It comes from our own thoughts, thinking things like, I'm not really sure that I have what it takes, and I'm not really sure that God's going to be there, and I'm not really sure if this is what God's want. And we start having all these, these doubts and these questions, and, and the opposition starts to come from the inside. And then we've got we've to make that choice all over again. If we're truly a warrior, we've got to courageously decide to boldly act for a worthy cause. I want to I want to share this to be to be vulnerable to be open um, not not to play a sad story or, or anything like that but um, we're we're about here in a few months to celebrate two years as a new church here in Southeast Georgetown, man. We're, but um, but uh, 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 but I would be I would be lying if I didn't say that there were some Mondays that you wake up and you as a pastor and you think man. This is hard. <laughs> is it really worth it? I'm not saying that to, to play, play a sad story. I'm, I'm saying that because sometimes all we see is the best from other people. And we don't see what's going on on the inside. We don't see what's going on behind closed doors. But it's always in those moments that God reminds me, he reminds other people, maybe he's reminded you that, look, it's a worthy cause. It's a worthy cause. Maybe you've kind of gotten in in something. You've gotten in on, on a ministry. You've gotten in on a, on a nonprofit. You've gotten in serving where God has, has placed you and there's been some opposition. And right now you're kind of in that moment and you're asking that question, is it worth it? Should I keep going? What's the cost here? This is a lot of sacrifice. This is taking longer than I thought it would. It's taking more money than I thought it would. It's taking more work than I thought it would. Listen, God's called you to be a warrior and warriors persevere when there's opposition because the cause is worth it. There's a third thing um, 
about being a warrior. Not only does this person pray for wisdom and persevere in opposition, the third thing is this, he, he or she protects the defenseless. Protects the defenseless. In other words, um, this person stands in the gap for those who can't defend themselves. That's what David and his men did when they went to Keilah. There was a people here that could not defend themselves. And, and I want you to know that, look, David had nothing to gain by going to Keilah. He had nothing to gain. There wasn't a trophy that he needed to add to, to, that he needed to, add to his shelf, was there? He already had the trophy of, of King Saul's, uh, sorry, Goliath's sword and his head. He didn't need another trophy. He had nothing to prove. He had just taken down the Philistines' greatest defender, Goliath. He had nothing to prove. He had nothing to win. He had nothing to gain, and yet he went to battle. Why? Because a warrior protects the defenseless. Even when the defenseless don't give thanks and don't give appreciation, because you know what happened later on if you read the story? Saul hears that David's in Keilah fighting battle against the Philistines. Because he's pursuing David, he starts coming to Keilah, and David hears about it. Saul's coming. So he inquires of the Lord again, and he says, Lord, will the people of Keilah surrender me to King Saul? Seems like a, a weird question to ask God, right? I mean, of course they, surely they wouldn't give him over after, he, after all that David had done for them. I mean, he just defended their city. He had protected their families, their children, their livelihood, their land. He had just done all this for them. And here's what the Lord says. They will. When Saul gets here, the people will give you up to King Saul. And so David leaves. What a show of appreciation, right? Gee, thanks for nothing. Why? David had, look, David had nothing to gain. He had everything to lose, and yet he protected the defenseless. Listen, today, maybe God's putting a cause on, on, your, on your life. Maybe you're right smack dab in the middle of that cause. Maybe it's a cause that you, you engaged in, but you've, you've kind of stepped away from. Maybe it's a cause that you're, you're right in the, in the thick of it, and, and today God just wants to, just to kind of remind you uh, that, that he is faithful, that it's not you that's doing the work, that it's he that's doing the work in you, and you just need to be encouraged today and know that that's that warrior hat, that warrior role that you play. It's not something that we get to set off to the side and say, not today. Maybe you haven't been engaged in spiritual warfare, you haven't been engaged in the battle, and today God is saying, look, there's more to this Christian journey, there's more to this Christian life than you just kind of going through the motions and living clean and happy and being blessed and all that kind of stuff. There's more to it. Listen, there's, there's a work that I want you to do. Listen, maybe you're here today and, and you would not identify as a follower of Jesus. You would not identify as a, Christi as a Christian. I wanna talk about this one just for a second. A warrior protects the defenseless. I want you to see that's exactly what Jesus Christ did for us. That's exactly what Jesus Christ did for me. It's exactly what he did for you. He protects the defenseless. To protect means to cover. Uh, we had a, a, a freeze this week, right? Um, temp temps went below 32, uh, and so the frozen. How many of you went out and you put something over your plants in the flower bed? Yeah, several of you. What were you doing? You're protecting them. What is? It's covering. You're covering the plants, right? Covering is protecting. Maybe you you've had the mental picture of a of a hen covering the little chicks, right? What is she doing? She is protecting the little chicks, right? Maybe you're, maybe you're mama bear, right? And you've got the kids and you want, you want to protect them, right? You want to cover them. Maybe you're a football coach and you're like, come on, let's cover the field, right? Let's get in a good defensive protection, right? So protection equals covering. Let me show you a verse in First uh, Peter. I believe we have it on the screen, maybe. First Peter 1 verse Eight, thanks. <laughs> Love covers a multitude of sin. Isn't that good? Love covers, protects a multitude of sin. Because here's the thing, our sin deserves death. We have an enemy 
who's known as the accuser, who attacks. And those are attacks that we cannot bear because the penalty is death. He is coming after our lives. But Jesus Christ, in his great love, he came down, took on the form of a man, and lived the life that we could not live, and he died the death that we could not die, and he went to battle against the enemy. And here's the thing about Jesus. He rose again on the third day victorious. Our Savior is not a defeated Savior. Our Savior is a victorious Savior. He is alive, and today he's seated at the right hand of God. He is our defender. It is his love that covers our sin. He did what we could not do. And listen, we have a role to play. And that role that we play is that we have to trust him. We have to literally uh, step under the, the shadow of his wing. We have to place ourselves and, and trust that what Jesus Christ, the covering of, of the cross of Calvary, the blood that he shed, we have to accept that and receive that for our lives. It's not something that, that I can do for you. It's not something the person sitting next to you can do for you. It's a decision that you have to make to trust in the covering of Jesus. And scripture says that he makes all things new. That when we do that, the old things are gone and new things are come. And here's the thing. It doesn't matter if you've been a sinner for 10 years, the blood of Jesus Christ covers those sins. It doesn't matter if you've been a sinner for 35 years and you're like, well, I don't know, I've accumulated some big ones. Guess what? His love covers a multitude of sin, a lifetime of sin. It doesn't matter if you're 99 years old. Love covers our sin. I don't know about you, but I'm so thankful, so thankful that Jesus Christ's blood covers my sin. Would you pray with me? If you're here today, you never trusted Jesus as, as the Lord of your life. You never made him king of your heart. Scripture says that anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That is a promise. And we sung earlier about how God's promises are true. They are faithful. They're never ending. Right now, in this moment, you can call on his name, and I believe that he will save you. Not because I'm telling you to, but because he's drawing you, because he's stirring in your heart, because you know deep down that you are lost without Christ. That you don't have purpose and you don't have hope and you've been searching the things of the world and none of that has satisfied. Jesus says, look, I'll give you living water that you will never thirst again. I will quench and satisfy the deepest desires of your heart that you have been pursuing and chasing and that the world cannot offer. Man, would you, would you accept that? Would you receive that into your life today? Maybe you'd pray a prayer like this. God, today I recognize that sin in my life has separated me from you. God, and there's an enemy, there's an accuser who is, who is attacking, and God, the penalty for my sin is death, but I recognize that Jesus Christ died in my place so that I could have eternal life with you. And God, I don't fully understand that, but God, I fully believe it today. And I ask that you would save me and you'd make me a new person from the inside out. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.